our rural cap um, in collaboration with the Alaska Tribes Extension Program, which are the two organizations bringing us together today. Um, so I just wanted to start off by welcoming us all into this virtual space and just acknowledging where we all are. So we're all on different lands. Um, we here at Rural Cap are on the lands of the Denina people. And wherever each of us is, we are all on the unceded territories of indigenous peoples. And we honor and um, uh, want to acknowledge the land stewardship practices and place-based knowledge of indigenous peoples, which benefits all of us. And um, along with the traditional foodways and land stewardship practices, many communities in Alaska are also participating in gardening and farming activities to take care of the land and feed people. Um, so this conversation is about how gardening and subsistence fit together or maybe don't fit together. Um, it, it's a conversation with all of us here today. Um, so if at any time you um, want to add something or ask a question, please feel free to put that in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and I will pass it off to Glenna, who will be moderating the discussion today. So thank you so much, Glenna. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks Thanks for the housekeeping and, and the land acknowledgement. I'll just start by saying I'm currently joining from Za Tanan right now, uh, also known as Fairbanks, Alaska, and Lower Tana Dene uh, country. Um, and today we are really excited to be having a discussion with um, friends from around the state. So we have Nasrak Rainey Hobson from Anaktubik Pass joining us. We have Shoji who um, I'm sorry, I forget if you're in Fairbanks permanently or Nanana, um, but here in the interior. Um, and then we also have got Gata Hayek, um, and you're probably going to have to correct my pronunciation, <laughs> Dia. So um, excuse me for that. But I just want to say a very warm welcome to all of you. I'm really excited um, to hear what you have to say. Um, just so everyone is aware, today is really just an opportunity to have a conversation. Um, so we're talking to our panelists who all have experience in different ways working with both traditional and traditional foods, as well as um, more westernized or domesticated uh, food production, uh, and doing that to support food sovereignty and food systems within their region and their tribes. So um, with, with that little bit of background, um, really, we're just going to use this time as an opportunity to share what's important to us. And I'm going to um, mostly just ask questions of you guys, and you can jump in uh, whenever something is meaningful or you have something to add. Uh, I'll try not to put people on the spot too much. Um, so if you, yeah, if you feel uh, inspired to speak up about something or you want to bring up a different uh, topic or uh, anything of your own, I welcome that as well. Um, I'm just here to guide. I'm not in charge. <laughs> Um, so, so with that, the, really the first question, just to get us started, to get us talking about this is I'm curious to know if you guys can share a little bit about what your, um, relationship to food is, what are your cultural values around food? How are, how does, um, that shape your relationship to food and vice versa? How does food, um, fill in to your filter into or shape your cultural values? Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it open to any of our three panelists to get us started. Maybe I will call on people. <laughs> I can go. <laughs> I can go. Um, hi, I'm Gadgeta Hike, and I am from Metlakatla, and I work at the Sittendoit Gum Geltup Community Garden here in Metlakatla. Um, and what were the questions, Anne? What? Yeah, so the first one, it's really just, what are your cultural values um, around around food? And how does food also f shape your cultural values? So really, what does food mean to you? What's your relationship with it? Um, and it's just, this is just a <laughs> icebreaker. So <laughs> it can be as much or as little as you want to share. <laughs> um, well, like, you know, all Native cultures, like food uh, is one of the, one of the primary connections for us that we have with the land and 
um, and working at the community garden and me being a forager and harvester myself, food helps me have much more respect and connection to the land. Um, you know, working at the garden has really helped me understand and appreciate the growing process and um, and the land, like making sure it's healthy and um, well taken care of. And then that, you know, slowly trickles into my daily life as, you know, as a human being. And I guess that's all. <laughs> Thanks. Rainy, you, you looked excited to say something. Oh, <laughs> I probably have, I probably have the worst connection. So I'm trying not to jump, jump in too much, but, um, my name is Nesogrok Rainey Hops, and I live in Anuktuik Pass, and uh, I run gardens in the Arctic. Um, so what does food mean to our culture? And uh, my mom also, in back, by the way, <laughs> I just realized we got people from all over the state. I'm on the North Slope in the Arctic region. But to, to, to me, and kind of, it's food for us is mostly, um, connection with community and with each other it's it's uh it's a relationship it's a love language both for um each other and for the land i mean food is basically love and um history and everything you can think of really but yeah thanks nasrock shoji you got anything to add yeah sure uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shoki. Uh, my English name is Nels Christensen. I live in uh, Tanan in Fairbanks uh, full time, and I work in Inanna in the summers. And uh, working within food systems and gardening has been really influential in my personal connection to my culture. Um, and I just love everything about farming and you know, the idea of being out on the land and in this reciprocal relationship with what we're trying to bring forth into this world. And um, yeah, I just feel very blessed to uh, live in Alaska and be able to interact with the land in this way and, uh, and to learn more about that and imagine a future in Alaska where we can all benefit from this reciprocal relationship with nature. Thank you. So that's a really nice segue into my next question. Um, and and we'll we'll get to the types of food production and um, gathering that that each of you practice, but I'm just curious of if each of you have um, just a little bit you want to share about your vision for for a healthy, food system um, for a food, a food future, if you will, um, for either yourself or your community. Um, if there's anything you're striving for or that you're, um, is in your, what drives you? What's your vision? I'll go first. I think um, my goals are not just food sovereignty and, and, uh, you know, most of our food comes from out of our village, but for me, it's also a mental health issue, um, being connected with where your food comes from, being involved in the process of gathering your food, um, knowing, you know, all the science behind your food. I think that connection translates to connection with community members and with each other and with tradition. And I think for me, um, not only is it eating better food make you physically healthier, but I think eating better food and being involved with food mentally, um, it helps mentally. Uh, and that's always been my kind of goal and also something that I experience with my own, you know, with growing my own food is I feel more whole and more connected. And when I'm, you know, harvesting lettuce and giving away to elders or 
finding the biggest squash and handing it to a bunch of little kids and telling them to go bring it to somebody. <laughs> you know? We get to talk about things and be in awe and be be like, wow, <laughs> you know, there's excitement and there's connection. And to me, that that's the most important part, not only physical health, and physical well-being, you know, getting out there and moving, but it's also the mental health and the connection. Thanks. I know each of you is a visionary, so. <laughs> I can go. Um, for me, it is a mental health issue and also a, like a whole wellness issue and getting our people more connected with the land. Um, our, our resources do come from out of state and um, for me, like my own personal goal at the garden is to be able, not just the garden, be able to help provide food, but also encourage more of our community members to have their own gardens. And then also have, um, I'm trying to establish a, uh, within the community, like a indigenous food forest because we do have members in the community that can't get a route around the island to access stuff. So that's been pretty cool to start. And then the more that people know about it, when they go out harvesting, they'll like bring me a bunch of berries to dry and save the seeds. Or, you know, I'm trying to cultivate wild rice. So a friend of mine came up to me with a big baggie of seeds from the flowers. And, um, you know, I see all these ways that uh, it it builds community and it's pretty, uh, for me doing the work, it really does help my soul. And I'm hoping that can help other people get overall wholeness and wellness. Yeah, very um, common theme of physical and mental well-being, certainly in relationship. Shoji. Yeah, uh, I really love what's been said about, uh, you know, the social aspects of how we can change and work together. Uh, and the indigenous food forest, that's kind of a, a similar sentiment that we share with uh, what we're up to in Inanna of wanting to establish a uh, education culture center for uh, primarily for indigenous people, but for people uh, to learn about these uh, traditional ecological knowledges and uh, how they apply to agriculture. And as far as what I want to see out of the future, um, I want to see my future kids hanging salmon strips in the smokehouse. Like that's a super major thing that I want to feel 100% confident in moving forward. Um, so, and apart from that, uh, I'd love to see berry propagation and wetland conservation um, be at be a priority for Alaska moving forward because I think that we should all be eating berries. And so I'd love to see that. And also uh, learning more about the traditional ways that uh, caribou have been managed in the interior with the use of caribou walls and trying to return to some of that knowledge uh, to best manage our animal populations moving forward. Thank you. Um, that's, yeah, what a represents really, um, all of your answers to me represented both the merging of, you know, the traditional and the new um, and in your vision. And that leads into my next question. And you've all mentioned different aspects of this, but, um, you know, I, I want to get more specific on it because that's the topic of the conversation today is gardening um, activities combined with the subsistence. Um, and I will use traditional foods. That's, I don't know, my preference. And I know from many of my friends, the um, subsistence is a complicated word. So um, we'll, we'll just use uh, traditional foods or wild foods. Um, 
instead of that. But um, so when you're working on activities, all of you have mentioned, um, or you, for your food visions, you've all mentioned gardening or agricultural activities. And I'm curious to know how each of you see um, gardening or agriculture fit in with the harvesting of wild foods and the calendar for wild food harvesting. Do those things go together? Do they compete? Um, things that you've found uh, where they the, those activities actually support one another? Uh, I can go first. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I find that it's that's the most uh, intriguing, I guess. That's my one of my passions is finding out how it fits, how it meshes. I find that if people say they don't belong together, I get really stubborn about it and try and figure out how they fit. And uh, some examples, um, because I do live a subsistence life and also do gardening, some examples that I found were uh, here in, we do spring fishing, ice fishing. So we fish for char and um, lakers and stuff like that. And I found that, um, one of the things that we need a lot with growing food here in the Arctic is we have very, our, our soil is very poor nutritionally. We have nutritional like uh, deficiencies. And so I found that if I ask people to give me their leftover pieces of fish when they're cooking, if they decide to cook it instead of freeze it, the stuff like um, the guts and the bones and you know tail you know a lot of people eat the, the head but if they give me all the pieces of those fish they catch in the spring from ice fishing I could take those and freeze them and then use them as fertilizer in the high tunnel so that's one connection that we we've found with uh with gardening and subsistence the timing works out perfect and it might be completely different you know in other regions but for here it works out really perfect with the uh, spring fishing and then everything thaws and then I get the high tunnel up so it's perfect timing and another example is um we do fall caribou hunting you know and that also lended itself another source of uh, um, fertilizer uh, we use the there's something called what they call pudding it's not really pudding but it's the digested partially digested things that a caribou eats and it's stored in their stomach and we could take that material, which is which is uh, all the stuff they've been eating in the fall time, partially digested with enzymes and all this wonderful stuff, this pudding, which is edible. And we take that and I store it. And um, if I'm lucky, I could get it into Ziploc bags and freeze that. And since it's all winter long, it's easy to store outside. And that also is a really good um, source of fertilizer and so it's like this kind of seeing where we are at subsistence wise and how that fits into uh, gardening it's most people think it's the opposite way where we think of agriculture first subsistence next but in my mind it's subsistence first and then agriculture how can we use subsistence to su supplement agriculture so it's like I don't know. <laughs> and to me, that's, you know, the, the fun part is uh, finding these relationships and finding how they fit together. That's really cool examples. Thanks, Rainy. Anyone and this, else? the, the caribou pudding too was um, just ta real quick was um, actually an elder would do that. And this is a cultural thing where they would take the pudding of caribou and they would place it in the patches of the plants that they wanted and they wanted to grow um, when we had a nomadic life. So this is like based off of a traditional cultural practice of put, taking that pudding and putting it at the base of plants. So this is how I found it out. So was listening to elders and being part of that whole process, but yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> it's like the original Bakashi compost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you guys have the original patent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. 
Um, yeah, any, anyone else want to talk about how, um, and, and Amanda, I see that you had your hand raised, but maybe we'll get through this and then and then circle back to you if that's okay. Um, but uh, did, did either of our other panelists have anything they wanted to add about how um, their gardening or agricultural activities fit into to their wild and traditional food harvesting practices or seasons? Yeah, piggybacking off of what was just said, uh, we kind of do the same thing uh, historically down here with the fish camps is they used to put the salmon carcasses in uh, in big ditches and then uh, they have the Indian potato and then they would let that sit every year and then that would be where they would put their potatoes. Um, and that's what I've heard through fish camps throughout the whole island is that's a thing that they do. So, they that's, do, so that's a thing, a I thing I just... to try to do here at the garden. Pretty cool. And then you think about the co-evolution of those potatoes with like fish fertilizer, right? You know, yeah. We did research on it. We'd find that they you know, are more disease resistant, grow 10 times as much when they're grown together, because that's how they, they were stewarded and evolved. Shogi, do you have anything else to? Yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind when thinking of like, what, uh, you know, what it means to have a garden in the subsistence calendar is like, uh, I've heard stories from elders talk about you know, within the past hundred years, they say, yeah, we, we all used to have gardens back in the day before, you know, the stores kind of uh, monopolized on that. But I think that it makes sense culturally to think about uh, installing a garden and then having uh, vegetables to harvest at the same time as like moose hunting. And uh, so I don't think it's out of line for us to consider uh, implementing agricultural practices really at any point throughout the year. And I think that that kind of has to do with the reasoning of why we would do those things, um, like for our traditional subsistence um, activities, those are cultural in nature and based in reciprocity, whereas um, the dominant rule of thought behind some of these agricultural practices are uh, like imposing, like taking an action and imposing it upon, you know, nature to get a result out of that. So bridging that disconnect between how we understand our subsistence activities to undergo and, uh, you know, trying to pair that with what growing, you know, vegetables would look like. So these questions of trying to kind of fill in the gaps of where these two ideologies uh, overlap, you know, I think that there's some very interesting ways that we're answering that question now. And one of the big things that I see people talking about is this intertribal agricultural knowledge exchange. So, you know, uh, when I hear about like trying to grow wild rice in Alaska, that's very exciting, you know, trying to figure out which crops are going to work, um, you know, across Turtle Island and throughout this exchange, I think is going to be a very exciting thing to see develop over the next 15, 20 years. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, those are all really great examples of, of how these two systems maybe aren't so different if you look far enough back um, and into different cultural histories and traditions um, and then merging from what is now sort of two distinct sets, the things that work um, within each. Um, Rainey, I loved your example of thinking about how those active, the agriculture, what we now consider more Western practices of agriculture and gardening, how to fit those within, you know, the subsistence comes first. They don't have to compete. They don't have to be separate. Um, but one kind of nests within the other. That's a really nice way to think of it. Um, I know Amanda had raised her hand. Um, do you have any uh, specific question or comment that you wanted to share? Yeah, um, I kind of just wanted to share my experience of living off the land and um, making a garden every year, including um, 
So my family and I live out on, on the land about seven, eight months out of the year. And I currently live in Circle, but we're out along the rivers and always doing stuff that um, involves my culture and activities with fish, hunt, and trap. Um, I'm always trying to get folks back on to the land and experience those things. And the program that I'm I'm working with now is to introduce that, but um, I'm also working with tribal conservation districts. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but it's it's a great way for tribes to um, to become a tribal conservation district so they can work and have funds to be able to make a garden, um, to work on food security. So I encourage um, tribes to, to become a tribal conservation district just so they can help have helped with that, um, with those goals. And um, so the program that I'm working on right now is to um, try and get people to make their own garden. I try to give them tips and um, ideas that I I am currently doing. Um, I would like to probably get, um, I totally forgot my train of thought, but <laughs> it's it's just great that um, that and that this conversation is happening. This, um, it's kind of bringing a whole bunch of ideas into my head, and it's just coming back to this program that I'm working with, and it's all in connect connection with each other. It's it it's great. I'm I'm working with agencies to help the tribes out and. One of my goals was to get a, a community scientist, um, a biologist in each community to study um, not only what's going on in their communities, but to um, to help like the state of Alaska do like moose surveys and caribou surveys and so they could have a better say in what what's happening in and around their communities. Um, and that will help them do like proposals and stuff within their ACs um, to help them with that food security. But this is kind of like all interconnected and this is great um, to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for sharing your experiences and what you're working on. I that actually, um, you guys are making my job really easy. <laughs> uh, brings me to one of my other questions: was um, are there any particular resources, um, whether that be a fund, an agency you're working with, a funding resource, things like that, that um, have helped you propel your current activities around, um, you know, food systems, uh, food production in particular. Um, that have been helpful. So resources, um, yeah, agency partnerships, things like that, that you have felt really helped move the needle um, for for I, realizing that food vision we were talking about earlier or getting you on your way. You know, it's a, I know it's a process, right? <laughs> so uh, speaking behalf of like, um you know, trying to create indigenous agriculture in the interior is the reality of it is that's only been a possibility realistically recently. So um, I work with uh, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Survey, um, uh, for soil, uh, analyze, analyzing soil and remediation in Ninana. So they're our main partners in a lot of aspects. Uh, and that's working alongside Calypso Farm on that uh, soil project as well. So NRCS has been super major um, for my work, but apart from that, uh, 
this level of support that we're able to garner from the state right now and from the USDA coming into Alaska more is really, you know, it's a recent thing and it has to do with climate change. Um, it has to do with uh, politics on a state level. So it's an interesting time that we live in. And I do really think of it as sort of a indigenous uh, agricultural renaissance of sorts, because, you know, when we consider that, hey, we have been doing similar practices since, you know, forever, then uh, it really is uh, a revitalization rather than something brand new. Yeah, well said. Uh, I work with um, a few different people. I work with uh, UAF right, and uh, Ili Salavik College, which is our tribal college in the North Slope. With Ili Salavik, though, I do um, like little workshops here and there. Uh, I also work with our local school. I go in there and sometimes I could find a teacher that will start plants for me in the fall or in the end of the school year that I could grow in the high tunnel or give to uh, village people in the village that want a garden. And mostly what I try to work with is the children because one of the biggest, um, and they kind of move it along more and just people locally because one of the biggest barriers that I found is, is, um, is a more the mentality that agriculture is not part of our indigenous identity. And so, most of what I do is introduce things that are weird and odd, like summer squash and kale and things like that, that people are not familiar with because they're not available in our village because we, you know, those are very delicate vegetables and they, we just don't have them here and kind of introduce people to things they're not familiar with. And so I do a lot of um, cooking workshops or I just go to the school and I, make something that um or I bring something that they've just never seen before and we kind of talk about it and laugh about it and become familiar with it so there and most of what I do is with kids because I want them to be familiar with things that are a little different than what their parents are used to and I find that those kind of those kind of relationships and those kind of connections locally are the most important uh, and they help what I'm doing the most because they create local interest. And it's it's very uh, easy to, for it would be very easy. I get also um, help from my corporation. They have funded a bunch of stuff for my business, but um, funding has never been a problem for me. Most of what it has been a problem is local understanding and involvement. And so that's where my focus is, uh, to not be scared of kale and to not be scared of collard greens. <laughs> and I find I find equal things like we eat a lot of sourdough here traditionally. And so I'm like, well, this collard green is just like sourdough or this is just like, you know, sourdough and we could ferment it. Let's try that. Let's find out what happens and see what it tastes like. A lot of times it doesn't taste very good, but the whole journey of it is just like the learning process. We're learning about this stuff. We're exploring it. We're excited about it. And a lot of that excitement has is uh, present children with younger people. And that kind of bleeds into the older generation. <laughs> and, you know, it's um, so those are the those are the connections and the people that help me the most is people locally and all that. And I've seen other um, endeavors with agriculture and uh, small villages fail because they did not have the local interest and local involvement. And so I'm always pressing for that first is um, you can make all you want, you know, you can make all these plants all you want, but if nobody's eating them and nobody's enjoying them, eh, then it's kind of, it kind of peters off what I found, so. Hi, can I share? Can you guys hear me? Sure. Yeah, yeah um, we ahead. just, 
my Inupia name is Aishana. My English name is Tia. I'm, I work for the Kanaiti Indian tribe down here in Dena'ina country in the Kenai Soldatna area. And um, I, we just had our first, we we're calling it planting a potluck group. Um, the tribe has two really big greenhouses, but I focus on wild plants. And um, so we've got the elders um, that, the elders program and they're signing up elders who want to come with and meet with the youth and, and do this planting a potluck. This week we planted seeds and um, I mean, they had the vegetable seeds, but I found um, and I ordered some store-bought seeds for things like angelica. Um, of course we got peas, but I also have collected a, a large number of different kinds of um, wild seeds. And so we planted the wild plants. So I have wild peas and then they planted the other peas so that the um, elders and youth can, you know, watch them grow up together and then um, do a taste test, I guess, from um, the difference and see if there's a difference between the wild and the store-bought. Because there's quite a few seeds you can get now. Like there is, you can buy dock seeds, you can buy sorrel, um, Angelica, um, the beach peas, I haven't seen those for sale. We just gathered those in our raised beds at work. Um, but, you know, and of course the adults were pretty excited about the, some of them were pretty excited about the wild plants, but everybody enjoyed playing in the dirt. And since we live in what I guess colonizers call Alaska's playground, um, it's really shrunk up a lot of places that, would have been traditionally um, uh, used for fishing and hunting and gathering. So for us, having everything in a central location, because we'll have some of those plants growing in the greenhouse and we'll have beds outside the greenhouse um, to expand on our existing raised beds at the wellness center um, so that we can start adding some of those wild foods. and. Um, but I just loved, it wasn't my idea for the planting a potluck, but at the end of this season, um, they'll, you know, have, they'll come together with things, wild things they harvested with some of the vegetables and even spices. And then um, they'll do a big um, potluck and share the food that they grew together or harvested together at the elders, um, one of the fish days that they have. So I just thought it was, Brilliant. It wasn't me that came up with that, but that was one thing. And it's a small thing, um, you know, even if you just gather, you know, seeds from something, you know, people eat and, you know, that people are interested in seeing, you know, what kind of foods are out there. Yeah, so. that's a, another, thanks, Isna. Um, I know that's, a, that's another really great example of traditional stewardship and harvesting practices um, being combined into a more modern you know, growing out a local garden versus um, stewarding those seeds and wild patches, you know, throughout a region. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that example. And I know there was people interested in the chat about where you uh, got your seeds from. So um, maybe you can drop uh, uh, some tips in there for people uh, who are interested in getting wild seed, or if you guys are growing out seed and saving any, um, that might be another way for people to connect the network across the state. Um, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I can email you, Glenna. I'll email you the links because okay. um, I collect a lot myself and I'm going to write up a list. I have a few. I don't mind sharing um, the seeds. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. So, yeah. And any other comments from our panelists on, um, oh gosh, what question were we on? Anything you want to share <laughs> um, about? Uh, yeah, how how your um, what resources you're tapping into um, to make make your activities successful, um, and then um, if if there's nothing else you want to add about that, my next question was pertaining to um, any tips. Um, so resources that you do currently use that make your activities successful, or tips that you'd like to share with other individuals or communities who are looking to use both traditional foods as well as the um, some more domesticated uh, or grown foods 
uh, to add toward to to aid in becoming more food sovereign. Um, tips, tricks, practices, uh, or and or resources, um, funding agencies, partnerships that have helped make your program successful. Got Gate, I know you didn't get a chance to respond to that one, so. Um, I've just been networking like crazy throughout the whole entire state with anybody that uh, has to do with food. And it's been um, really helpful. My program is underneath the tribe, but they don't uh, put any money towards the garden. So I've had to um, figure out grant writing really quick and uh, started off small with little small grants. Um, a lot of uh, rule cap was helpful and uh, spruce root was really helpful. Uh, the USDA uh, has been helpful, but their grant applications are pretty crazy. Um, and just, Working with the Alaska Food Policy Council too has really opened up windows into different networks working throughout the state. Uh, the cooperative extension has been helpful um, with educational stuff as well as you know just networking with resources. I'm constantly getting emails of what's going on in the food and indigenous food and food waste. Uh, so that's really been helpful um, to be a part of that. And, and then too, what Rainey said with, there is this like relearning of food uh, I've experienced with the growth of the community garden. Cause as I start to sell the produ produce back to the community, a lot of people are hesitant uh, because it's so fresh um, and, you know, realizing within the community, a lot of our elders, they, they used to have growing up the victory gardens, but then um, barges started coming in with canned foods. So like my parents' generations, they're used to all canned food and that then got passed on to me. So we... I see this trend of the younger people learning how to use and cook with fresh, such fresh food. Um, and it's been interesting to see. And I wanna get to that pl point where Rainey's at, where I could start having classes and getting the community more involved, but it's been a lot of this um, building up the community garden with resources. Yeah, that's... That's a, you know, I'd say common theme and really good example of of the the time it takes, right? It's an it's an investment of love and time, um, and I know Rainy, I've heard you speak to that before, but none of this is fast. Um, so I I'm gonna just quickly make a plug, um, not because I necessarily am endorsing any one organization, but um, because it's relevant to the time um, of the year and, and a resource that's available to indigenous folks and tribes right now. But um, the Calypso Farm and Ecology Center up here in Fairbanks is doing um, an indigenous agriculture program. Um, Shogi mentioned that he um, and Eva and folks in Anana have been working closely with them, but basically it's an opportunity to come get hands-on training for a couple days in the summer um, to really learn different food production uh, techniques, um, best practices, um, give you those skills to really learn how to grow food. Um, and then you can take that information back to your community. So I'm going to drop that um, into the link. Uh, and I know some other people had asked or mentioned about that program too, but it invites people from all over the state to come and have a, a hands-on learning experience that then, you know, help you uh, solidify those skills. Um, so that's one option that I know is a, a resource and there's an open up application period right now that might be of interest to folks. Um, and then, yeah, if anyone else from the panel or anyone on the um, 
the call right now has other resources that they've found really uh, meaningful to them, uh, whether that be funding resources or agencies or a program partner, um, you're welcome to drop those into the chat too. Um, and then I'll just open it up. Um, last question for our panelists. Um, any tips, you know, has there been something you, some of you have already talked about, um, Nasir Rock, I know you'd mentioned your like use of the pudding from the caribou, which I, I love. Um, I've, I'm, I actually want to talk to you after, <laughs> um, in more detail about that. I have an idea for us, <laughs> um, but, uh, getting, getting into some of the, like, actual nitty gritty of like tips that have worked really well in your local area. Um, you know, I know in Southeast, the use of the trenching with, with the fish product, um, you know, byproduct, the parts that don't get necessarily eaten. If there's anything else that you found really useful, especially when considering the seasonality of growing food. Um, Shogi, I know you guys were growing food along the river at fish camp, things like that where you're integrating. So any particular tips or anything like that or anything you just think is really fun and cool <laughs> that you want to share with anyone before we uh, open it up to questions and end here in, in about 15 minutes. If you guys well, can, for, we'll take yeah, questions. For, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's it's just my biggest tip is um, I don't know how to explain it. Like, be the fool. It sounds really weird, but be a learner. I mean, that's how I found out about pudding and all that kind of stuff is because I would randomly just be like, "Hey, let's go on a nature walk." Uh, I know a lot about I know stuff about plants. I don't know everything about the plants, but I will take the kids. And anybody, I'll announce it on the Facebook page. Hey, you want to go for a nature walk? And if I'm lucky, I could get somebody to sponsor it. But sometimes I'm just like, hey, let's go um, dig up roots or let's go do this or let's go do that. And some, you know, and, and I'll be walking and these kids and uh, older, even older people will show up. And I think part of that is just I'm willing to be embarrassed <laughs> that nobody shows up. <laughs> you know, I'm willing to to make mistakes and I'm willing to try things that don't work, you know, and um, to be the fool. And I think that that has been the biggest, biggest thing that has gotten me so far is I'm okay with that. If I failed, I've had a few years where we just didn't grow anything at all. And I've, I've been like, okay, <laughs> you know, that's fine. Cause our, our season is so short, but I'm okay with that. And I keep my eyes on the goal of uh, providing for my community. But that would be my 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 tip. <laughs> some thank you. It's, it's I you know the the asset base is you're a lifelong learner. You're not a fool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, being, being curious, always curious, always curious. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else have any tips they want to share or uh, we can start looking, seeing if anyone wants to, you can use the raise your hand function uh, in Zoom if if you can find that under reactions, it's the little smiley face with a plus sign, you can raise your hand and we'll try and call on you to ask questions or feel free to type them into the chat. I would like to mention, uh as far as tips go and resources. Um, uh, us planting along on the riverside, something that we're considering uh, for this next summer is using deep rooted crops to help reduce erosion and to preserve our riversides. And we do that too by uh, like knocking down the willows over the edge of the bank uh, so that the water doesn't just come take that dirt away. So that's, um, that's something small to think about as far as soil structure and where you're growing is super important. So that's uh, kind of our case. And then as far as resources in Alaska go, um, I'm glad that uh, Alaska Food Policy Group was mentioned. They uh, do some really great work as far as uplifting a lot of the things that we've talked about today. Um, uh, Alaska Resilience Farms, I saw that in the chat too. Uh, they're a great resource. Um, and Homer Soil and Water District, Conservation District, uh, they do monthly, weekly classes 
on things that have been pretty interesting. Um, so I've enjoyed what I've learned from them. They had like a pasture class a few weeks ago. That was very helpful. Um, and I'm glad that uh, tribal conservation districts were mentioned as well, because that's uh, we're really pushing for that in the interior. Um, there's only one established in the interior and that's around Vinitai. And I think that that's also important to highlight when we consider uh, combating the misuse of lands. Um, so, you know, if we were to see a Yukon Flats or uh, Lower Yukon, um, Kuskowim, uh, TCB districts, uh, like combining together, that could be, that's super important for us uh, to assert sovereignty and be able to see these kind of large um, agriculture processes happen. Yeah, big, big picture thinking. Thank you. Um, okay, let's, since we only have about 10 minutes left, let's see um, if there's any questions. I'm going to ask my um, moderator help friends. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think Linda I raised her hand. Hey, right, Linda, you want to come off mic? Do you have a question? There we go. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm new at this. Um, <clears throat> I currently live in Wasilla. My village is Tanacross, and I am interested, um, just started learning and growing over COVID and stuff. And then I've been working with my uncle, Jerry Isaac, in Tanacross, mentioning to him because of the declination in fish and you know, our moose is declining as well. Our food is going away subsistently and we're always having to fight for it. Why not, you know, become self-sustained? Why depend on the stores and the them shipping stuff up? Grow your own food, do community garden, which I'm trying to get everyone involved where you could do like shifts or whatever. And then at the end of the season, everybody harvest together, use the tribal hall, get um, freeze dryer, canning stuff and, and process it all together as a group and then distribute it among the family. That That is my ultimate goal. And then the other thing that came to my me last year when there was no Thailand there was shortage of Tylenol for babies and stuff and it's like we have so much herbs and natural things around here in Alaska that you could just you know make your own medicine and so this has started this um I want to do an apothecary and there's only one registered herbalist that I looked that's registered with the National Herbal uh Guild or whatever and um and she lives in the Gustavus, but I'm not sure exactly how she's doing her botanical um, garden. But me, I would like to offer it to where it would be uh, um, grow all the different plants in and in my area. And then, um, you know, if you want to have your own medicine, I have the stuff you can make it yourself kind of thing. The ingredients, you know, and, and also teaching everyone about, you know, what's what's uh, naturally out there and what the elders used to do way long time ago, trying to resort back to that kind of uh, thing. Um, Okay. And so now I'm looking for grants and stuff. I'm new at this and I, I need help. Okay. And so I'm also working with um, Lori. I think her last name was Erwin. I can't remember. She's a scientist and she is working with NASA uh, growing uh, vegetables and plants for out, outer space. And she's working with some of the schools in Anchorage, which I'm trying to get Connect Tribe, uh, Connect Charter School involved with her as well, because they just bought a building that has a huge greenhouse. And like last uh, yeah. last winter, they handed out Thanksgiving baskets with uh, seeds to, and they made cedar boxes to to use as a planter box to encourage the, the community to start growing their own food and I thought that was a really great idea but yeah so I'm I'm just yeah. looking for some help and uh tips and uh to get this going because I think it's it's a, a good idea and there's a big interest uh for an apothecary thanks Linda thanks Linda okay now I'm trying to figure out how to mute
Thank you. Um, yeah, sometimes there's an echo. Thank you for sharing your story and what you're working on. Um, hopefully this has been a useful conversation just to give you ideas, but also pay attention to what's going on in the chat. There's lots of resources, lots of books, um, individuals and programs you can reach out to to start trying to you know, build up your, your vision. Um, and then hopefully, uh, I have a, um, or Sinead, you'll be able to uh, save the chat after this, and maybe that can get shared out with people who registered uh, for this, because um, I know that's going to be a real wealth of resources for people to refer to in the future. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll put all of that together and send it out. Great. I'm sorry. Uh, and let's see any we've got about five minutes left are there any other questions that people have especially for the panelists or the body of very well connected and intelligent people who are on here today um and i'm sorry I had to... go ahead sorry can i have a turn really quick. Um, so um, I spoke to some of you in the beginning of this meeting, but a lot of you weren't here when I introduced myself. Um, my name is Amanda Pope. I work as a consultant for the Alaska Conservation District. And within that entity, I work for the Northwest Boreal Partnership. And I got hired to help build a program within the Yukon Flats to help them build, uh, well, uh, their program, which is called the Eyes in the Bush. And those community sentinels who are hired um, within that program document snow sampling, soil sampling, um, they do bee sampling, they do moose, moose tick surveys, they do all sorts of stuff within in and around the community. Um, another part of that Eyes in the Bush program is a hunter liaison. And they um, interview hunters as they come through their community. And, and uh, that information will help them get a better idea of how much folks are hunting moose, for example, how much are hunting caribou, how much are going for bear, and how much of those people are successful. And if they are, um, they can donate meat to their community. Um, I highly suggest folks to check out the Alaska Conservation Foundation page, which I put in the chat. Um, they help tribal conservation districts try to get up and going, and they provide assistance um, with collaborative um, partnerships to get funding. They um, help with whatever um, goals the tribes have. Um, I wanted to also share that with this program that I'm working with, I am hoping to have a community scientist within the interior of Alaska in every village um, who are not only documenting whatever's in and around the community, um, plants, the rivers, um, the breakup, uh, freeze up and snow and soil sampling. Um, I would like those folks to also work with the tribes with their goals um, for food security, for instance. I brought up like the beaver, um, reintroducing um, trapping of beaver and um, having the schools involved um, to where the folks would get back onto the land and uh, and reintroduce the culture basically um the culture is kind of kind of lost in my opinion so it's just a matter of those folks kind of bringing their ideas together um to try and get it back up and started again again for their people um i, I like what ninana is doing um they're really active in their community. Um, I know a lot of folks down there and I also, um, I like their ideas and their goals that they're working towards. Um, uh, another thing I'd like- We're at the top of the hour, Amanda. Um, I really appreciate right. you sharing what you're working on. 
Um, and I know that we we're only slated to one o'clock and we're losing a lot of folks as they have to go back to work um, or whatever they're working on. So thanks again for sharing what you what you've been working on yourself um, and what's inspiring you and your community. I just want to um, give a really huge uh, thank you, Oyak uh, Setnen uh, and Anna Vase and Koyanak to our um, presenters, our panelists today. Uh, this has been really a great conversation and we're really happy and honored to have you spend an hour with us uh, sharing the things that you've been working on, um, the resources that have been meaningful to you and your vision for feud, food in the future in your region. So um, for those of you who are still on, please, please, please look at the resources if you have questions or anything um, to follow up. I I would think that there's a way that um, we can help all network with one another to answer questions and um, make those visions a reality. So thank you again. Uh, everyone have a great afternoon. I'll hang back for just a second in case any of the real cap folks have anything else to add. But again, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Glenna. And thank you, panelists. Have a great day, everyone. Happy Bye. spring. Happy gardening. <laughs> <laughs>